Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When we look at the Word of God, we see that God is intimately involved in this world. It is wrong to think that God created the world and then took a step back. God is here. He is functioning. His sovereignty is revealed day in and day out. Now, that does not mean that we do not have choice. We do real choices. But nevertheless, God is in control. That does not mean that he controls everything, but he's aware of everything. And if he does not allow it, it will not happen. God has created this world to function in a certain way. Humanity to truly be human beings to the limitations that God has given to us. And we need to see that eventually God will bring about judgment. The scripture says that he will judge all things, not only our deeds, but our words and even every thought that we have. Everything is going to be brought under the judgment of God. And that's why we see in the scripture that the Apostle Paul, he spoke always when he spoke under the authority of the Holy Spirit, he gives us wisdom from heaven. And he once said that the real challenge, the real desire of every believer ought to be this, to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Messiah. That is wisdom when we acknowledge his sovereignty and we submit to his lordship. That is what a true disciple does. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm number 11. The book of Psalms and Psalm number 11. Now, sometimes when approaching a passage of scripture, it is helpful to get an overview of what we're going to encounter. What are the primary messages of the text? What are we going to learn from it? But in Psalm 11, I think it's better simply to, to jump into it and let it come about in a natural sense of revelation, allowing each verse to build upon the one that precedes it. So with that said, look with me to this psalm, Psalm 11, and we'll begin in verse 1. Again, there's an inscription, but a rather short one. So much so that the first verse and the inscription are, are placed together, both in the Hebrew text and the English text, which means that there won't be any difference in verse numbering in this psalm. Once more, verse 1. We read, to the chief music director of David. So David is the author of this psalm, and he's addressing it specifically in a way for the one who's going to lead the reciting, the chanting, the singing of this psalm. And we begin after the inscription with the words, In the Lord. Now, we know what an important statement that is in the New Covenant when one is in the Lordship of Messiah Yeshua, having received Yeshua into their life as their Savior through the Gospel, but recognizing who He is as, as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, acknowledging Him as God. Well, here David 
he says concerning the Lord that he's in the Lord. Notice what it says. In the Lord, and what is one of the great outcomes of being in the Lord? Notice what he says. Chasiti. Chasiti is a word for refuge, but it's a verb which means I have taken refuge. I have found shelter. So it's in this covenant commitment that David has, having entered into this covenant, that he can take safety, and that's the implication, that I have found safety with the Lord in him, in this relationship. And once again, what this scripture does is to show us that indeed God, and don't miss this, is a very present help in times of trouble. He's not distant. He is not simply a crater and then steps back, but he is actively involved in his creation. And therefore, we in faith can find shelter, to find help, to find a refuge against those who are attacking us. So David says, in the Lord, I have taken refuge. And then he asks a question. He asks a question, and we need to pay attention to the grammar here. Now, oftentimes that's difficult to do in English because the word you in English, we don't know if it's you, one person, or you, meaning you all as a group. But here we see that David is speaking to you, and when he says you, he's speaking to his enemies, not to God, but to his enemies. And we know that because he says, Ech tomru, how will you say, and it's how will you all say to my soul? Now, this is a use of the word nephesh in speaking about that inner human being. And what the enemy does, and this is true for the great enemy, Hasatan, Satan, and those that are under his his influence, they love to bring fear, anxiety, worries into a person. In fact, immediately before sitting down here to do this lesson, I was watching the Israeli news. And they were speaking about an event between the Israeli armed forces, the defense force, Sahal, and Hezbollah, that terrorist organization that that is in Lebanon. And on the Golan Heights, at a place called Har Dove, Dove Mountain, there was a, a conflict. There was an exchange of gunfire. And what we find is this, the commentator, and I agree with him, he was saying the primary objective of Hezbollah was simply to cause the residents in this area to be bothered, to be fearful, to be full of anxiety. That is enough of an achievement from them in this objective, in this uh, operations that, that they did. That's how the enemy functions. And notice David's response here to a similar situation that took place 3,000 years ago. When we see here David saying, how do you, meaning you, my enemies, you all say to me, say to my soul, flee unto your mountains. Now, This shows the strategy of the enemy. Your mountains is the same second person plural, you all, that we saw of the one speaking to David. When David says, how do you say to my soul, flee? And this word flee has to do with with not only movement, but it's a very emotional word. Many times, for example, it's translated with the phrase to bemoan something, to be full of of despair and an inner pain. 
And then notice what it says here. The last word is the word sipor, is the word bird. Now, it's a choppy verse. There's not a lot of, of transitional words, helping words, that make the sentence uh, easy to understand in English. So therefore, if you look at many translations, they have words in italicized, or they should if they add them, that are not literally in the Hebrew text. So David is saying, how is it that you, my enemies, say to me that I should flee with despair, bemoaning under your authority, that's what mountains are, your mountains under your authority, like a, a frightened bird. David says, I'm not going for that. That is not my behavior. Why isn't it? Very simply, because it says here that he has taken refuge in the Lord. And that refuge has given him inner tranquility, security, peace of mind, confidence. And that's what being in a covenantal relationship should, should do for you and me. Well, read on, verse 2. For behold, ha rashaim, rashaim, wicked ones. And David is showing a, a contrast between him and his enemy. His enemy, those are wicked ones. So he says, behold, the wicked ones, what do they do? Well, they, they bend the bow. And this is an expression for, for taking a bow. In a moment, we'll see the arrows mentioned in order to, to take aim and shoot at the target. And in this case, who's the target? Well, you know the answer to that. David is. But even though they're doing that, and notice what David says. Now, this should be a, a confidence builder for us. This should give us peace of mind, confidence that if we belong to God, we need not be full of anxiety, stress, fears, worries. Notice what David says here. For behold, the wicked one, ones, they bend the bow, they prepare their arrow uh, on the string. This would be the, the bow and the, the string or cord that, that the arrow is shot from. And it says, they prepare their arrow upon the cord to shoot at. And the next word, Aleph Fe Lamed. Now, this is an important word because it speaks about a, a darkness, a thick darkness and what David is saying is this you my enemies you can take that weapon you can bend the bow you can put that arrow on the string that cord that you're going to fire it but what are you shooting at and the word here ophel is darkness a thick darkness what David is saying is you're not going to hit me because you don't have in my situation being in the Lord, having taken shelter in him, your firing at me is obscure. It is like thick darkness. Now, by the way, this is the same word used in the book of Exodus to describe the choshek, that is darkness, but there's the word for thick darkness and that's what appears here and they fire at who this is their their motive motive of of behavior at the yeshrei lev at the upright of heart now this shows that those who take refuge in the lord they're the ones that are upright in heart they are concerned with that which is proper so one of the reasons that we can be assured that, that God is going to defend us is because we are with him in purpose. And that's one of the wisest things that you could ask yourself, and you need to ask yourself, as I ask myself daily, throughout the day, constantly, 
is what I'm doing under the authority of God and for the purposes of God. If it is, I can have confidence. I can have that inner peace. I can have that contentment, that insurance. But if I'm about my ways and trying to get God to bless my objectives, and if I am led by what I believe my purpose, my destiny is, devoid of revelation, then I'm exactly where the enemy wants me to be. So ask yourself, am I committed to the purposes of God? David is, and therefore he has that, that assurance that he is among the upright in heart. Look at verse 3. Now, verse 3, I believe, speaks about a, a description of where this world is going. This psalm, Psalm 11, is a great one for us to learn, for us to recite over and over and over and over. And the reason why is that this psalm builds up a, a spiritual confidence that we do not need to fear the enemy. Now, what does verse 3 say? Look carefully. It says, Ki ha shatot ye harasun. For the foundations, when they are destroyed, so the very foundations, that which should give stability in this world. Stability from what standpoint? A totality. Economic stability, political stability, social stability. All these things, they are going to be destroyed. They are going to, to fall and crumble. So what should we do? Well, notice it says the righteous Ma pa'au, what, the righteous one, what, what is his behavior? What does he do? How does he function in the midst of that? Well, we need to remember something. Look at verse 4. Hashem, that is the Lord, where is he? Be'hechal kodesho. He is, and if your Bible says temple, it's not the, the proper word for temple. It's not the word buy it for house, referring to the house of God. It's not the word Mikdash, the holy place, the Bet Mikdash, the holy temple. But it's the word Hechal, which what I would suggest to you is speaking about this inter-sanctuary, the holy of holies. And the reason why that word is used there, Hechal, for Devir Habayit is another synonym for it is that this is where God dwells when his presence is uniquely among us. And so David is saying, God, God is with us. Now, realize, David wrote this, there was no temple. There was not a functioning even tabernacle. But nevertheless, David, by faith, through his covenantal relationship, he believes that God is in that dwelling place with his people through covenant, through faith. So the Lord is in his holy sanctuary. The Lord in the heavens is his throne. Now here, heavens, it speaks about that which is greater than earth. There is greater power. There is greater everything in the heavens than on earth. And that's where God's throne is. So we use the expression in Hebrew to understand this, tau ve homer, light and heavy. And the implication is this. If God's throne, and maybe we should, would say this a different way, sense, biblically and also in our own language, many times we use the word if when really the implication, the intent of the speaker or the author of some statement is sense. Since his throne is in the heavens, we can be assured that it's greater than any earthly throne. Yes, when God establishes his kingdom, that, that throne in the heaven will be here in Jerusalem. But, but then time, that is in the meantime, what do we know? 
that throne in heaven is sovereign over this world. So he says, the Lord in the heaven is his throne. Second part of verse 4, his eyes, and this is the word, it's a verbal form for the word vision. Now, visions are a powerful thing. I'm talking about those who receive biblical visions. Biblical visions relate to, for example, the prophet or someone like John in the book of Revelation. When they received a biblical vision, they saw things from God's standpoint. So this word is speaking about the Lord having perfect vision. Absolutely a perfect perspective for what's going on. So his eyes, they see, and his eyelids, this is even his eyelids, usually the eyelids don't see in, in a human being, but with God, that's not the case. They have discernment of, of humanity. So God discerns perfectly. He has a, a perfect perception of what go, is going on among hum, hu, humanity god knows and therefore god not only sees but he has discernment for what he's going to do look at verse 5 the lord the righteous one he and this is a word for for test but but he discerns that righteous one's objective he knows the condition perfectly of the righteous one. He knows his heart, in other words. But the wicked one, who's the wicked one? Well, here we use a participle to describe the wicked one, the one who loves Hamas. Hamas is violence for the sake of violence doing something, causing pain and suffering of another because of a sense, a demented, a demonic sense of enjoyment that one receives by that. Now, if, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, if you're a believer, you do, it's hard to look upon the suffering of someone. I mean, today in the YouTube generation, you can see videos of about anything. And oftentimes, we'll, we'll see a suggested uh, video come up, and I'll say graphic. I don't like looking at those. It'll be speaking about perhaps a, some crime that was captured on a security camera, something that someone was able to film, and it's of someone that's going through a very hard situation. Now, perhaps... It's even a just thing. But we don't derive pleasure from seeing the pain and the suffering of others. It's just not something that, that our inner being, our soul, derives satisfaction from. And therefore, it's the exact opposite. The wicked one, he loves, this is how he's described, he loves violence. And therefore, what do we find? His soul, this is God, hates. It says that, that God hates his soul, this one who behaves in this way. And what will God do? Well, look now to verse 6. He will yamter. Yamter is, we, we have the word geshem, which means rain, and there's another word for rain. And this is the less known rain. It's known if you read the Siddur because we, we say it almost every day uh, in the wintertime. And it's a word for rain. So God will rain. It's him, third person singular, but it's referring to God. He will rain upon the wicked ones. And this is a word probably, I think the King James translates it snare. The word pach can be a snare, a trap but it can also be related to coals, C-O-A-L-S, coals of, 
of heat like uh, you would find in a, uh, a fire, an amber of fire. So God will rain upon the head of the wicked one coals, also fire and sulfur, sulfur and the spirit or the wind, and it uses the word for, for a strong, uh, a very strong wind. This is going to be the portion of their cup. Now, cup speaks about a lot, an outcome, a happening that has been decreed. And what God is saying is this, for the wicked ones who love violence, God's soul hates them or he hates their soul. And therefore, God will cause to rain down upon them these embers, these coals, hot coals, and fire and sulfur, and with strong wind, and that strong wind is going to heat up the fire. This is their portion. Verse 7. Verse 7, the last verse in our psalm tonight. And notice what it says. For righteous is Hashem. Righteous is the Lord. And what else? Now, notice that the wicked ones, they love violence. But God loves tzedakot. What's that? Righteous things. Things that reflect God's judgment, meaning what God deems as proper, that reflects His truth. What God sees is as a right outcome. So God loves these righteous things because he's a righteous Lord. And then it says yeshar. Yeshar is a word for straight, but it can be thought of as the, the word for the upright. We saw that same word back up in, in verse, verse 2 at the end. The enemy was trying to fire in the midst of a thick darkness at the upright in heart. Those who have a straight heart straight in the things of God. And we have a great promise here, and we'll close with this. Yeshar, yechazu, penema, which means the, the upright, they will gaze upon, and this is the same word for having a vision, that which, which produces perfect perspective. The upright, they will look upon, they will see his face. How do we understand that, seeing the face of God? Well, we all know the Birkat Kohanim, the Aaronic benediction, the priestly blessing, where it says, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. What's the next phrase? And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious. The Lord lift up his face upon you and he will give to you peace. So seeing the face of God is an idiom for experiencing his blessing, the fact that God will keep us, guard us, defend us, that he will be gracious to us, and that we in the end will experience his peace. That's the outcome of those who walk uprightly. And the only way that you can walk uprightly is when you are living in the faith, the faith of Messiah Yeshua. His faith that caused him to go to the cross to obey God's will. That same faith that, that regenerates us, saves us, justifies us, will cause us to live uprightly. Will cause us to pursue the behavior, the acts, the deeds that will mediate blessings upon us. That's what David teaches us in this 11th Psalm. Well, I'll conclude with that statement until next week when we press on in the book of Psalms. Until then, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. 
These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.